Hey everyone, I'm really excited that my channel has kind of gotten to the point where I'm able to start featuring some conversations with writers and authors and thinkers that I really respect. And I'm extremely excited to have the first conversation uh, be with Andrew Root, uh, Andy Root. Um, I'm excited about this for a lot of reasons, um, but mostly because I'm honestly a huge fan of his work. Um, I love, and I've talked about these books on the channel before, but I love his whole Ministry in a Secular Age series. Um, and in this conversation that you're about to see, um, we mostly focus on the, the most recent book, The Church After Innovation, though we comment a little bit on some of his previous work. Um, but we talk about, um, obviously, the topic of innovation. We talk about his take on where innovation comes from culturally and kind of the economic structures. Uh, we talk about his cultural philosophy work in diagnosing the genealogy of innovation. We talk about the implications of that for our how we imagine the role of the self and especially things like creativity and the anxieties that come with the intense competition that comes with the neoliberal, late, late capitalist, modernist economy. Um, we talk about the implications of that for the church and for ministry and for leaders of ministry today. We talk about the importance of being critical about where things like this come from, the ideas in our culture and how we might uncritically adopt them in, and use those as success metrics in the church. Uh, we talk about the surprising role of mysticism and Christian mysticism that could, it could, the role it could play in helping us kind of navigate these tricky waters. And finally, this was a shock to me, this was an exciting thing for me, but Andy talks about his next book, and actually, it's, this is the first, to my knowledge, and to what, according to what he said, this is, it's the first public reveal of the content and the title of what the next book in this Ministry in a Secular Age series will be. So that was a really, really fun, uh, fun part of the conversation that I wasn't anticipating. But we had a really animated uh, dialogue about it, um, and I really, really enjoyed uh, interacting with him uh, about the ideas, the, the stimulating ideas that are in particularly the Church After Innovation, but really the whole Ministry in a Secular Age series. So I think if you're someone who enjoys the types of books that I talk about on this channel, I think you're really going to like this conversation. And if you don't know about Andy's work, do yourself a favor and, and read his work. It's great stuff. I think that you will appreciate it quite a bit. But Without belaboring it any longer, I want to get into this conversation that I had with one Andrew Root. Welcome to Books and Big Ideas, What I'm Reading, What I'm Thinking About, with Joel Wentz. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. I'm excited to talk about this book. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to gush too much. Uh, I'm a huge fan, huge fan of your Ministry in Secular Age books, the whole thing. I've read them all. I think they're all just outstanding. In some ways, I don't know what my favorite one is. I'm not, I don't even know if I have a judgment on that. But in some ways, I actually, I'm curious what you think about this. I feel like the Church After Innovation might be almost the biggest, the biggest argument of the five. Mm. Um, that's how I received it. I thought this is a huge... And maybe it's because it goes in the economic direction, which we'll talk about, but it felt like in some ways it was the, yeah, the biggest swing, you know, in terms of a cultural interpretation. And it's in that for me, at least it was the biggest thing to try to wrap my mind around. I don't know. How do you feel about it as the person who put the argument together? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I, I feel definitely like, um, I mean, I guess anytime you have a book come out, you kind of feel a little like anxious or insecure about like how it's <laughs> going to be how it's going to be interpreted or if it's going to be read at all or, you know, you know, how that's going to go. But this one, I, I feel particular anxiety around. And, you know, it's, hmm. it's partly because starting saying like, at least my experience across American Protestantism, particularly, but even globally in some sense that everyone has innovation fever, you know, so to, to kind of come out and, and to ask critical questions against it, I, you know, I feel like is, yeah, I feel like people who have been, really on my side with a lot of these books will kind of there, there'll be a percentage of them that are like whoa 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 wait like i was all about uh... that i thought you were kind of setting the terms for that so it is a really big argument i think that's probably part of the problem of the book too is that um it, it, i i feel like it's more of an analysis than probably the other books in the sense that the other books are kind of description and then kind of theological construction mm -hmm. and this is a lot a lot of description and then a couple chapters of of some kind of theological probing of, of theological possibilities or kind of theologically why i think that this is important but it there's probably a lot more that could be done you know mm -hmm. in 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 this book um so yeah i mean i, I think some people are going to have the kind of sense of like well 
you really needed another 150 pages. And of course the problem is once it's another 150 pages, then right. no one reads it. So, right, right. Um, <laughs> right. you know, so, so yeah, but I do think it will be a fair critique that it's uh, yeah, that, that I end up, I end up taking one direction with this and there there's other directions you could, could have taken. Mm. I do see a, 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 a weight. There's a, a, the ratio or the weight of the argument is more on description in this one. I, yeah. I, I can see that. Um, although I thought, and we'll, we'll probably get to the mysticism chapters later, but I thought while maybe lower in page count, I thought those were extremely perceptive um, in terms of a constructive way forward too. So it's not without, I wouldn't say it's without that, but I see what you're saying. Have you felt like you, you said you're anxious? Have you felt as it almost sounds like you feel like you're touching a sacred cow or something like you're touching to mix my metaphors a bit uh, like you're, you're touching something that's yeah more at a core than you have in the other books. Is that? A way to put it it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that way i mean i think at the core uh that the other books touch something more fundamental or well, that's sacred. what i, I mean, that's like, what i would yeah, say yeah yeah kind of thinking about but i guess this is you know like a late late modern early mm -hmm. 21st century like uh third rail kind of issue once you start talking about capitalism and money uh mm -hmm. people can start getting really anxious with you you know and it it, it seems to kind of so quickly divide people so um yeah i mean i I don't know why I feel kind of anxious about it other than I think it has been the discourse about innovation has been kind of the way forward. Like if yeah. there's going to be a way forward and I think we're past this, at least in a lot of communities inside of, of, of American Protestantism, at least whether mainline or evangelical kind of past the certain protectionism, you know, like retreating just to the tradition. I mean, you can still find it some, some places, but I think we're past that. And so kind of to question it, seems i think odd to people because it's like well wait a minute we already kind of agreed that we're moving forward with this and that we that the church has got to do something different it's gonna it's gonna die and i actually can kind of completely affirm that like i think that's really true i'm just really worried that if we don't think about some of these yes i don't know some of these perspectives that we're that we're using to move forward and it doesn't mean eliminating them i just think that they have to go through some kind of critical engagement um that will end up adopting some things that are not so helpful man that's so yeah that resonates with me so much and you do um you try to be very precise in the book about uh saying things like these are not value neutral propositions like just assuming yeah. and, and you know but I, I appreciate the attempt to be nuanced too to say like let's at least just question the logic doesn't mean we yeah. need to throw it out uh, per se um, but let's let's zoom out a little bit. Um, yeah, I'd yeah, love yeah. to for people who might be watching this who maybe haven't read any of the books in the series yet. Um, this one takes an economic angle, which we've already alluded to. So like what I don't know, do you want to in broad sketch like what is the economic argument you're making? And, and then we'll connect that to innovation. Yeah, I mean, I. I... I think that the larger argument I'm trying to make is simply around innovation is just just simply say like we have to face the fact and that might it might be okay but that this this attention to innovation that innovation is embedded in a late capitalist system and so let's think about that and mm -hmm. let's think about how how we adopt that but my overall real kind of genealogical argument i mean this has kind of been the the pursuit of all now five and there'll be a sixth volume here they're all pretty genealogical which may be a little bit self-intelligent on my part <laughs> like i don't know i just like thinking about how you know we got to this stuff you know sure. like I, I i think there's other ways to do things like where you look at empirical numbers and graphs and things like that and and try to kind of simply look at the as as a kind of cause effect realities but i really like the idea of how our imaginations get framed and how complicated that is and and so i'm trying to do that here and and you know capitalism has a kind of um a la max Fa max faber has this kind of sense of a genealogy you know this really fascinating argument that's quite a contested one but for the most part i follow that that capitalism is really born out of belief a certain kind of mm. belief uh, you know a post-reformation uh mainly reformed um kind of puritan if you will uh kind of form of belief that it's that capitalism is produced out of people really really trying to live faithfully for god trying to uh, make ordinary life and everyday life really matter um you know that this kind of transition from a very much a, a praying class to uh, a kind of working sense where your 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 priesthood if you will is kind of lived out within how you work in the world and so there is a sense where you know 
doing the Charles Taylor stuff in the other volumes, and I, I circle back to him, but there is mm -hmm. both the genealogy work, but the sense of kind of examining what, what it means to believe here and how belief, you know, Ch Taylor's whole work in a secular age is really to think about how the conditions of belief have really changed. And yeah. that's ultimately what it means to live in a secular age is to have these conditions of belief change. Whether you believe or you don't believe, you're still inside very distinct and changed conditions of belief and i just tried to add the other element here of how, how capitalism does that and of course never take my eye off or at least i try not to take my eye off even with this book being more kind of philosophical kind of more of a philosophical cultural history um still try to always keep the pastor and the church mm. um, uh, at kind of front and center here so belief doesn't go to kind of how did that how does that change political systems or belief doesn't even go to like how do we think about religion in america or in the west i really always want to keep the practice of the minister um kind of central here and that seems fascinating to me because I think we, through this kind of reform perspective, we used to have this way, or, you know, early after the Reformation, the way you believed and the way the church kind of made certain proclamations about God and the world spilled out into the work world. And I think it's kind of fascinating to think here mm. in the late part of modernity, we've had this blowback where now yeah. this form of work you know in a, in a hyper neoliberal capitalism has flowed back into the church like the reverse stream back into the church and now what qualifies as really good ministry um often is assumed to be kind of innovative ministry and it might be again you know i'm trying to right, try right. to be nuanced here it might be but it, that's really interesting like what mm -hmm. debris come comes back when it's when it's swept in and i do think i mean you know i'm trying to be quite Charles Taylor, ironic here, you know, like if there's anything annoying about Taylor for being such a beautiful, <laughs> lovely human being, he's almost too beautiful and lovely. And he's so ironic, you know, it's like, oh, is it bad? Is it not bad? Just I don't stand know. for it's something. Like, yeah. 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 Right. You're like, Taylor, just tell us what you think, you know, <laughs> just pound your fist on the table or something. And he won't do that. He'll always respect people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I guess I want to do that in the sense of like, I don't know, maybe there are some really good ways to do this, but by the middle of the book, I do really worry that some of the debris that gets washed back with that flow makes for some issues of formation, make it particularly the formation of the pastor. If we're not really clear, the formation of what's a good congregation, um, the formation of just people um, in their faith life. If we're not, if we're not, if we're not really, I don't know, if we're not really willing to think about it, it, it could lead to some problems. Yeah, man. Oh man. Well, speaking as a pastor who has pastored through, the pandemic. Um, I also occupy, I was in a parachurch campus ministry world for a while too. And actually it's, it's fascinating. I don't know how much I want to go into this, but like, I'm even comparing, I'm reflecting a bit on the local church ministry in a time of upheaval, cultural upheaval. And I'm comparing that to my time in a parachurch ministry, which had its own flavor of kind of innovation pursuit, I would say. Um, which reading this book put a lot of words back to that experience for me anyways, which I, yeah, I'll pin that for now. Um, but I, the image of the backwash was really, really helpful, I think, and um, a little disgusting, but helpful too, to think like, you know, there's this stuff that might be washing back in like, and even the, re the reversal of the, I don't know, I don't know how to phrase it, the cultural power, the cultural influence of the church that went out for a time. And now it's almost like we received it as a given, but actually it's been reversed. And so we need to at least filter in question, which is, yeah, I'm just putting different words to what you've already said, but yeah. But I would love to figure out because the the uh, or figure out that's a that's a bold you know step. But at least talk with you about um, how diagnosing the genealogy of innovation as it's within this capitalistic kind of mindset paradigm. How does diagnosing that help the church make wiser decisions as it relates to innovation? Like how does that genealogy help us? If that makes sense. Yeah, uh, and this probably takes us to the to the kind of end of the book, so we can always circle sure. back to to fill in things if you want. But um, my biggest concern is that the way the way this late capitalism works, um, and again, you know, like I I I don't know why I feel the necessity to say this, but I'm not like against capitalism. You know? Like, <laughs> I mean, when when you yeah. ask me to do like this youtube channel I, i'm doing it because i like you and we, we we met you know and and uh outside boston and had a right. good lunch together and you know doing it because i want to talk with you but also thinking like you even said coming on like hey i can expose you to 
maybe yeah. some people in my channel that don't know you and maybe they'll buy your book you know so here we like in some sense even this very intellectual act that i hope has goods beyond just like selling books there is a kind of sense of like i'm i'm so deep into the, the capitalist system too so yeah i don't want to be like naive and be like oh it's all bad and, and, and in many ways i guess the way i've i've lived my life i'm i'm very supportive of of kind of capitalism and being on the edge and you know getting a speaking honorarium and, and and things like that but i do think that there's certain ways that the neoliberal capitalist move has been pretty diabolical and pretty diabolical in a theological way you know so mm. i try to trace this and and i guess this goes back through the whole series joel it's like i i i am really captivated with a lot of taylor's work but i'm really particularly captivated with the the late 1960s revolution that happens you know that that he he really triggers as as the kind of moment that the hinge point that brings this age of authenticity in and that something really does change this kind of romantic bohemian sense that had been kind of a um kind of a minority report if you will like a, a a kind of small a small kind of enclave sense of way of living for artists and others in in kind of paris and berlin becomes writ large after you know 1968 and into the 1970s and that we all in some sense become bohemians we all become kind of romantics after that i'm interested in that and i'm interested then in, in this book of how a different form of capitalism brings that about and there's just this really you know I guess I'm kind of obsessed with with the with the 20th century too. You know, mm -hmm. like maybe I'm just like a classic Gen X kid raised <laughs> in like the 90s. You know what I mean? Like, I still I now three decades into the the, the new millennium, I find myself longing for maybe longing is too strong, but like thinking back to the 20th century a lot and thinking about how how that's made us into who we are now and. I'm just I'm fascinated by this transition that happens that, you know, these contested moments that I feel like live so deeply in our consciousness now is, you know, after the 60s and into the 70s, you have this economic crisis. And one of the main theorists I build off to, to do this genealogy work is Daniel Bell, who's the Harvard um, sociologist. And he talks about the cultural contradictions of capitalism. Yeah. And he's really writing like he's writing in the late 70s and he's kind of writing on what's happened since the counterculture move and he, he really goes back to the to the post-war and the kind of keynesianism economic reality that really saved the west in many ways got america to be this great economic engine where you did have to make every family into its own little stream of of spending and consumption that would then make a huge you know roaring river of american consumer mass society and his point is that 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 thrust a kind of contradiction upon the worker um, is that the worker in this Keynesian economy needed to be a kind of Puritan at work. You just needed to do your job. You needed yeah. to do your duty. You needed to um, kind of follow the directions of the manager. It really wasn't about you, for God's sakes. It was about the <laughs> yeah. corporation, you know, um, and you got a lot of protections from the corporation for doing that. It, it was not a very warm and fuzzy experience for the most part. Um, and the manager was tended to be fairly cold and the, it was really the objectives of, of meeting whatever the company's larger objectives were. Um, but you got these product per you got these protections and then you went home, though. And this is what Bell means by the cultural contradictions yeah. that you needed to be a hedonist at home. So the idea to keep this economy kind of moving and to keep World War Three from coming mm -hmm. to keep from an economic crisis you had to you had to take your kids out for burgers and you had to get a new car and you had to and make stop sure at the bar you, on your way home from work and yeah and really the bar was the way to transition between these two things you know mm -hmm. so like in, in many ways i'm always thinking of madman when i was writing this book you know like mm. madman was these particularly men and women these men but women too who were were who were in this this transitional point and really pushing us to another level like madison avenue really was was pushing us beyond this but you could see how they did that like don draper is you know kind of work 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 drinks yeah. and then goes home and, and kind of draper's issue too is he can be two people at you know two different places and uh but he was supposed to be the the loving you know buying gifts to his kids at home kind of hedonist taking your kids to to disneyland and by hedonist i don't mean like you're yeah. raging and you know like right. 
a, out of a control. porn star or something. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah. more like uh, you're you're just living for pleasure, and you right. and you it's important to have pleasure. So you need a new TV, and and you need quick food, and you know, mm. fast food, and 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 you want to watch, you want to uh, take your kids to the movies, and Disneyland is a, is is very appealing. But I so I think that there is a sense, like in the genealogy I'm trying to work, is that there's always been a kind of cultural contradiction to to capitalism, and mm. and that does start back to the to the earliest form where you know it's, it's it's quite an interesting theological contradiction that the people of pure grace um, yeah. and justification by faith alone, these Protestants, would create a system where it really matters how hard you work, you know, like that. That was one of right. Faber's most interesting things that these people who believed that their salvation was based in God alone and uh, that mm. there's nothing they could do to save themselves. Nevertheless, that form of belief created a kind of work life where you had to work really, really, really hard all the time. And that mm -hmm. every second of every day belonged to God. And so there's a kind of cultural right. contradiction that's in, in the most part balanced by a larger theological commitment. And then when we go to the period we were just saying, you know, like post-war, post-World War II America, there's a different kind of cultural contradiction. God is out of it for the most part. We're now in a secular age. Right. Um, there's God's no larger theological it. commitment that we've all agreed to. No. Yeah. No. And that's why the bar becomes the place to yep. balance the cultural contradiction. It becomes a place for moving from the rigid kind of puritanical place of work which has no God in it, but you just need to work hard. Every mm -hmm. minute counts. You need to show production. You know, you need to, you need to, to honor the kind of rigidity of the company. And then you would balance that contradiction by having a stiff drink, maybe talking about war stories with your friends or right. what, whatever. And then you would go home and you'd be this kind of hedonistic all American dad, if you will. Mm -hmm. But that all breaks down. And, and, and I think bell can point to it because it's all breaking down in the late seventies and particularly mm -hmm. what breaks down is just, constant growth like the american growth economy seems to be you know not not happening and uh so to to kind of get back to the growth you have this birth post 1980 79 and 80 where you have uh thatcherism and then reaganism who creates this they they really go back to a 19th century um kind of economic theory and i am no ec, you know eco economic uh scholar of economics or an economist or anything like that but um from a kind of philosophical place they go back to this 19th century um kind of view of free markets and uh in many ways it produces the growth but it creates all sorts of new things and it, yeah it, uh, and one of the things is it, it does is it, it obviously strips away regulations so companies can move towards growth but now you have a new cultural contradiction or a new issue to face which is how do you get workers you have to renew this kind of capitalist move and and i guess one of the bridges is that you know the counterculture for the most part rejects this kind right. of work they they regret the counter the counterculture or the the the, the uh, contradiction, contradiction they 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 kind of throw it off right they the, throw it the, off i mean yeah the dutiful loyalty but hedonist thing right. that's being held together doesn't hold for the counterculture yeah 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 right and and my point and my point is that these these Post nineteen, you know, forty eight kids born after nineteen forty eight, the baby boomers, the Billy Joel generation, you know. Right. If you listen to Billy Joel, it's just like soaking with this kind of every song is soaking with this kind of logic. Is that they mm. were born completely in the hedonistic, expressivist side of consumer capitalism, mm. and so then all of a sudden they turn eighteen or twenty two or whatever, and they're told no. You only get part of your life to be a kind of expressivist, um, kind of capitalist kind of reality, a particularly consumerist kind of expressivist perspective. And they're not so sure they want that. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of reasons that they they go to the hate and they, you know, march on Washington. Um, but a lot of it, I think, has to do, I mean, this is my perspective, a lot of it has to do with the rejection of this cultural contradiction of capitalism. They don't want it. If yeah. if work cannot be expressivist, if it cannot be a way to kind of express your most unique, authentic self, then they're not so sure, sure that they want it. And for a while, they reject it. And, you know, other other realities come into play, but it leads to economic hardship into the 70s or 80s, or at least it at least leads us into wondering about the growth. And now you have this really strange thing, which you have all these cons more conservative economic folks who want to allow the markets to be free again. But somehow you have to renew the contradiction of capitalism. Mm. Like you, you need to get this baby boomer generation who are now in their 30s or something, you know, um, into the 1980s. You need to get them to work long for for, you know, they need to work hard and they need to work 
uh, long for less protections, you know, like less pension, less mm. retirement, all that. How are you going to do that? And one of the, I think, most interesting things is that the kind of people who hated the counterculture movement um, really uh, take elements from it and yeah. lift it up and make it now a place where you can work on where work can be that. And what I mean really is they take this kind of sense of the self being an expressive yeah. um, center of your universe that the only thing that really matters is how you are developing yourself, how, how your self is working on itself, how, how you are being a unique self and work becomes a place to do that. And I think, you know, mm. middle of the 20th century and back, no one would have thought work is the place where you are most, yeah. you know, your most primary and, 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 you know, significant self but now that becomes the place to work on the self and uh i think that starts to 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 do some damaging damaging things to us but it also fits in with this way that you know pre-1980 no one could sit in their bedroom or there are very few like steve job stories you know where you just go to a garage and you have an idea and you can turn this into a company that could could punch IBM in the stomach right. and make it feel it, you know, like that was just wasn't possible with the, mm. with the kind of firmness of the regulations within the economy. But now that's possible. So you can see how that reverberates. Like if you could be yeah. a kind of self like Steve Jobs, then look what you look what you could do. And so there, there becomes a kind of new moral code, which is to find the idea and find your most creative self and to go after that creative self. And it really does become a kind of sense of winners and losers. And yeah. are you going to win? Are you going to keep winning? Win, win, win. And I haven't, I, you know, I, I'm rambling now, Joel, but no, I, it's know, great. I, I, I keep on thinking about, you know, like I was raised and I'm a major, like kind of into, into sports, you know, like grew up really into sports still now, you know, have all my teams I follow. And I think there's really a, an interesting kind of connection of how sports has both been relevant to people, but also help perpetuate this kind of neoliberal win at all costs kind of thing. Like yeah. life is really about a competition of victory. And it's just no wonder that as this kind of economic system goes, you know, and becomes more all encompassing. So does things like ESPN and fantasy football mm. and, and, you know, like, and, and just wearing a, wearing a Jersey, like, you know, like my dad was pretty into sports too, as a, as a baby boomer, but he would he could have never been caught dead wearing like a Minnesota twin shirt to a baseball game with like a 22 year old guy's name on the right, back of it you right. know like as a yeah. as a 45 year old man he would have never done that like he, he like took me to like costume yeah right right he took me to like five six baseball games a year and he was always in a polo and khakis you know what mm -hmm. I mean like mm -hmm. um only the kids were in hats and jerseys, but now it's mm. you know, kind of everywhere. And it's it just, it's interesting to think about how competition plays in. And, um, mm. and, and I think that that kind of filters into the way we, we see the self and the way we see ourselves in the world and, and so forth. Man. Yeah. It's so my brain's going in a lot of different directions, but two things that come up for me as you articulate that shift in the shift into the kind of the neoliberal competition, everything is competition. Like every calculus is a competitive one. Um, and I do want to pivot to talk about the self, but what, what, what's coming up for me are two things. One is the anxiety that the, the intense anxiety that comes with a, could I be the next Steve jobs on some level, even if it's, you're not able to articulate it, you know, that there's, there's only one Steve jobs, <laughs> you know? And so the idea of being that one is comes with an unnamed anxiety, but the second one is the implications for the shift in management culture, like mm -hmm. how the manager comes from almost, if I read, read your book correctly, the, the genealogy pain is a manager preserves that dutiful loyalty in the first contradiction and then moves towards a kind of cultivating like a a garden for self-expression or like development in the man that's a really different vision of management yeah. and it yeah. just brings up so many questions for me for people's people that live through that shift and 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 then sorry i'm like stringing a bunch of questions together no, no, take this great. take this whatever way you want but as i read those implications for management and the anxiety that comes with the self creating the self. And then I think about ministry and maybe this can pivot into the ministry and the self, but like, how are we uncritically, we meaning like pastors and ministry leaders like me adopting the logics of management as cultivating self-expression and then turning, feeding that into things like spiritual formation or maturity. I, I, you know, it raises a lot of what it feels like really pressing questions for me. And how do we minister to the anxiety that comes with or anxiety we might be complicit in perpetuating so yeah there's yeah. a lot of i just rambled a bunch of thoughts at you but i take no those are great thoughts yeah i mean i think the, the way i would get into that is to say 
you know, the way to balance the cultural contradiction that we now have in, in neoliberalism, the way to make it livable, like there's no way to, to balance it in a way that you feel like, I mean, this is one of the reasons that across the economy, um, especially people with privilege within the economy, mm. we'll always talk about looking for work home life balance, like right. balance becomes a huge major issue, because at a deeper kind of existential level, capitalism itself has to find some way of balancing and it's it's usually off and it usually, you know, kind of leads to all these contradictions, but some way that it becomes coherent. I mean, it kind of in some sense, like the great resignation was in some ways being like, screw mm. this, like, yeah. this balance is so off, I'm not going back. And we mm-hmm. have to find a way in many ways to get people back on this this uh, teeter totter to be able to balance it. And I think what, what balances it before, if it was kind of like the hard drink before you go back yeah. balances it in the sense right. of duty and preparing to enter it. Now, what really balances it in this neoliberalism and by now, I mean like, you know, post 1985, really you mm-hmm. know, like what balances it is creativity itself. So mm. you now need to go to work and you have to bear the anxiety. And this is something that, um, Andres Retzvik says in his book, A Society of Singularities, which is Taylor leads me in, but, in, you know, Hartmont Rose has been significant and kind of opened this up to me. But then this Retzvik guys, I think is just a genius. And he, he talks about how human beings need kind of ritual and security, but ritual and security is the death to mm. a neoliberal economy. Like wow. your if your business needs to continue to grow and win victories, and if you're a big company and now you're living in a kind of Darwinian neoliberal war and you could get you could get maimed by a much smaller animal like right. IBM does with Apple, what what it pushes you into is that you need to constantly innovate. And there's both a kind of eschatological dream to that. Like if we could just find the next innovation, we'll be yeah. we'll be able to take on anyone. But if you're a big established company, you're also thinking like, well if we don't innovate, we're going to get eaten by some smaller company. Like there's, we can't, we can't rest Mm -hmm. here, which we maybe Mm -hmm. could have in the fifties and sixties, you know? So this moves us into this kind of state of permanent innovation that starts to happen in this neoliberal economy, which I, it's another angle on the dynamic stabilization. I think you talked about in the previous book, this roses. Yeah. It it builds on that, that you have to continue to kind of grow to, to just even stay stable or else Mm -hmm. it all falls apart. So the problem becomes with that, okay, so if you're running a company and isn't this exciting that you can just start a company out of your garage and that you can build it within years into a a, a force. I mean, uh, I've been watching another show I've been watching. Yeah. I just finished Showtime's uh, Super Pumped, which is a story of oh, Uber. I've never yeah, heard of it. Oh, wow. It's really good with, uh, um, yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a great show. It's it, I, I found it just fascinating. Huh. To, to read it alongside this book will really yeah. trip you out. But um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's just this sem- sense like you could just do it and out of the sheer, sheer just desire, you can kind of build it, build this thing. And that's great if you're the founder. You know what I mean? Like right. you're willing to you're going to create the unicorn. You're you're going to do this. But how do you get all the other people who are don't have the same stock options you do? Mm. And it's not their identity wrapped into being the founder of this. How do you get them to accept this? And, and Retzvik's points is people need ritual and security. But in this permanent innovation economy, ritual and security, workers having ritual and security will not lead to the permanent innovation you need. So you somehow need to get people to accept constant instability and a kind of drive beyond you know security they and and not resting in any ritual and the my point is the way that this becomes done building off retzvix and others is creativity becomes the way to do this so you say to people like Mm. you have to work long hours yeah the pay isn't that great maybe yeah um it's it you're under anxiety all the time because you know we're just a small firm, but we're trying to win, 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 win. And the founders on your butt all the time, but this is creative and you get to be creative Mm. and it's all about creativity. And in some sense, it gets all reframed that it doesn't matter if you're just, well, what do we have from subway that a a subway person isn't making sandwiches. They're a sandwich artist, artist, you know, in the book, I go through these other companies have used something similar, you know, Mm -hmm. like um, Kate, I think it's Kate Spade or something. They don't, they don't have workers. They have, they have muses, you know, like mm-hmm. they, they, they don't, all these kind of, or the people that work at Disney phrases. world are, are cast members. They're not, they're you know, cast members. Absolutely. Attendance they're, or, see, yeah. they're not picking up like garbage that's right. falling on the ground. That's right. That's not, they're being something creative. They're mm-hmm. being a cast member, you know, so mm-hmm. everything gets repackaged repack- in this creative way. And so mm-hmm. now maybe you work at a law firm 
and you get yelled at, you know, for 40 to 60 hours a week, but you're told that what you're doing is really creative. And it's somehow mm -hmm. the manager's job then becomes to frame and to reshape and to present every form of work as somewhat creative. Because mm -hmm. if you're doing something creative, potentially the idea is that you will accept a lot of insecurity and a lot of anxiety for the sake of this creative act. And there is something kind of theological about that. There's mm -hmm. something about what it means to be made in the image of God, that we are really drawn to creativity. Um, there's something about worshiping a, a, a God who is fundamentally creative, um, but that gets totally kind of subverted in, in a certain way that yeah. what becomes the, the center in the ultimate element of creativity is you yourself you need to find creativity yeah so the manager isn't even really managing anymore the manager is a coach and right. you're not in a department anymore you're on a team mm -hmm. and you're not really doing a job necessarily anymore you're doing a project and all of those things have a kind of sense of create creativity to them and that balances this cultural contradiction of capitalism which it you take on all of these um kind of well again insecurity and, and yeah. these kind of forms of negativity and and the anxiety like you're saying you take them on because you get to be creative wow. and um and i guess i want to question that i want to mm -hmm. i want to partly question for pastors and others like what does it really mean to be creative and mm -hmm. um, well the question that comes it, up for yeah. me is what are we being creative towards or for right. you know what yeah. are we innovating towards and in, in the neoliberal and this of course, it brings up, and I told you I'm rereading Taylor right now, so it's bringing up all the collapse of transcendence and the imminent frame and all that stuff, but it's just fresh in my mind. But like innovating towards just getting bigger and surviving within that neoliberal machine, there is there is no transcendence there. And for me, I can't help but think about more of the contemplative Christian tradition, and that maybe this will hook into the mysticism stuff that you wrote, yeah. uh, wrote about, but like creativity more more in the broad sweep of christian tradition create being creative or reflecting on creation is just to contemplate it for its own good you know for its mm -hmm. own sake and and it or ways that it might you know bring you into awe and reverential worship of of the creator um those purposes seem lost here you know <laughs> i don't think that's too strong to say it just seems utterly lost and that that's where it does make me shudder a little bit when i think about this uncritical acceptance of yeah. it in the church so uh, I don't know yeah. anything you want to build off there. No, I, I mean, that goes to the kind of Taylor point. I don't I don't go into this as much, but I do reference it, which is the kind of transition from living in a cosmos to living in a universe right. where he says mm -hmm. this becomes part of the loss of in a kind of larger frame of transcendence that when you live in a cosmos, every natural phenomenon, there's a, there's a story within it all. It all speaks. So if you, you know, all of a sudden the sky turns orange or there's a super red blood moon or something like that, there's the assumption that there's a message in that, that God's mm. trying to say something, that, that this is pointing to something. But when you live in a universe, none of that stuff really kind of matters right. anymore. And so you can see how that happens here, where the transcendent referent that we all kind of yearn for i mean i think we could say what what's happened in a neoliberal economy is works become a form of spirituality like work becomes a spiritual yeah, place oof. to work on the self but the issue is that there is no you're you're now in this kind of universe and you're in this very hyper kind of competitive one and so there is no transcendent referent outside of you so the, i think what taylor really means by transcendence and this is always i think hard for people is he means transcendence as that which is outside that encounters the self you know mm. um, and some people will be critical of taylor because they're like well there's so much spirituality you you surely can't be right to even call this a secular age but his point is the conditions of belief to assume that there's something outside the self that could meet the self or there's just a that there is a kind of in breaking transcendence becomes unbelievable to people but that's all been transferred then into the self and so now there can still be a, a, a certain kind of sense of transcendence, call it with a lowercase t or something, or there can be a form of spirituality. It just has its beginning and the, its end in me, wow. inside of me. So your manager in some sense becomes a spiritual guru, which is no wonder like Google and all yep. of these, you know, the height of innovative economies have all sorts of spiritual practices that they provide yep. for you. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's mindfulness exercises or a meditation app or a yoga instructor, they have all that, but part of the objective, like you're saying, is for what is to, yes, they want to feed the spiritual depth in the spiritual texture of their workers, but that, the, the assumption isn't that that spirituality has its source outside the self, but within right. the self, and if you're really in touch with yourself, then you'll be able to cope with 
mm. the dynamic stabilization, the need to continue oh to gosh. grow, 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 yep. grow, do more, do more, do more. You'll be able to cope with all that. And uh, you'll be able to cope with all the insecurity demanded of this. You'll be able to cope with the fact that you could show up tomorrow, have worked for a company for eight years, given your whole life to it, lost a marriage because of it and have them say, oh yeah, we got bought by another company and your job is done. You know, um, oh. you, know, you, you, you take that on because at work you're doing something spiritual that there's a sense that you're working on yourself and now your manager isn't managing the operations of the corporation. Your manager is managing right. the people and making sure that the people feel, feel fulfilled and that continue to remind everyone all the time, even if they're, even if they're doing the most menial exercise that it is creative and therefore mm -hmm. it's working on the self. Therefore there's a form of spirituality to it. Therefore it's worth um, all the anxiety Oof. and uh, all the depression that it well, imposes on you. On some level, you have to believe that that risk is worth it, you know, yeah. or either you have to believe it or you have to just not think about it. <laughs> I think those are maybe yeah. the two options um, and it can't, can't seem to hold. Um, mm -hmm. But man, I, I want to explore a little bit more of this, yeah, that my mind immediately goes to the meditation rooms that, you know, you see in those like big open, open concept offices and startups and whatnot. But like you pose, and this was fascinating to me. I was not expecting it. When you get to the last couple of chapters, you pose mysticism, you go into the mystical kind of path uh, as a, as a way, potential way forward, or at least a reminder of it as an option. Um, I'd love to hear you just unpack that a little bit more, especially as it relates to everything you were just commenting yeah. on. Yeah. And like we said, at the beginning of the conversation, there's probably after chapter three or four and and you know like the, the whole critique of creativity too i'm always right. like oh my gosh people are gonna be so mad at me <laughs> uh, around this because it is a sacred cow to us and sure. again this is the kind of performative contradiction i have to live under i love being i mean people look into where i'm sitting right now and some of them probably want to vomit but i love this little space i have my computer here i write here like this i mm. love that i get to get up and you know do something creative. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is a sure. little bit, uh, it's a little bit rich that here I am critiquing creativity. Well, but... and I'm, I'm a content creator apparently on YouTube, you know, so there's a creative act even in like getting this video yeah. out there. So yeah, we, we right. all, we are embedded in all this stuff. Absolutely. And I guess in some sense, I would say like, I, I guess I would choose this over it being 19, you sure. know, 54 or something like that. I kind of, I'm, I kind of like this quite a bit, but I also do start to realize it starts to do things to me. Um, mm. and you know, like it, it starts to impact the way I see myself and see the world and the way I start to compete with ev everyone, you know, and, and sense a, a digitalized version of this neoliberalism and, you know, what that, the kind of steroids that injects to it. And now you have all sorts of algorithms and, and analytics to tell you directly how well you're doing, you know, like, I think what that ultimately ends up doing, and, and this is kind of gets to the middle of the book in chapter seven. So I asked the reader to really hold on with me and let this argument build, but I, and there are other, there are other turns we could have taken, but I try to take this to what I think is ultimately problematic that we have to think about in the context of ministry is, is the anthropology that this opposes, the kind of yeah. theological anthropology, the way that this views the self yeah. as a performative self, that the self is fundamentally performing at all times. And so I feel like the only Ooh. way to break the performative self, oh, you know, at least intellectually to start thinking beyond it is that you have to return to a very low anthropology as opposed to a high anthropology, which takes you into kind of thinking and, and kind of using the Reformation against itself in some ways. Um, and so it, it took me into Luther, which isn't a surprise for someone who teaches at Luther Seminary, probably. <laughs> but um, but then to go beyond Luther and go back to these these certain mystics that impacted Luther's thought and particularly the, these Rhineland mystics, these German mystics um, from the 14th, from the 13th and 14th century. And I think they're really fascinating because even unlike their other fellow mystics, their emphasis is on the necessity of the self to let go of itself, hmm. the self to lose itself, to be able to find itself in union Um with God to find itself in union with the Trinitarian reality, to find itself um, in union with, with the living Christ, that there's this necessity to kind of let go and find yourself to the ground. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm building off people like Eckhart and John Toller mm -hmm. and others, which is, this is this kind of unique tone or tune that these kind of mystics sing um, where there's this sense that you can only find God by letting go and losing the self. Like you have to enter into nothingness to be able to find the possibility of God's fullness. And, and so I, I, I just wanted to put those folks in dialogue with this. Yeah. Think of, 
you know, it, it, it is really fascinating that Luther's definition of sin is when the self turns in on right. itself. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's, it's just really fascinating how we have whole systems, especially around kind of middle-class work life that really ask people to turn in on themselves. Yeah. You know? And, um, oh. and so, you know, this, this is just, this is where kind of innovation is. So that doesn't mean we can't use innovative practices, but we do have to somehow they have to be crucified enough to get mm-hmm. rid of this kind of anthropology out of mm-hmm. them, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm not exactly sure how that happens, um, but it, it has to happen in some way where the self, the self, we have a different relationship with the self and that yeah. creativity is not embedded in the self, but there's some kind of reality outside of it. So, I don't know if this can happen in work itself, but it surely can happen in the life of a Christian community where yeah. things like confession become more important than creativity. Absolutely. Like how do you confess your own impossibility? How do you confess that the self's performance actually gets you nowhere at all? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that will be really counter to the way that this economic structure works, this economic reality works where it needs people who really want to be performative selves and perform and perform and perform and do more and do more and do more and burn themselves out and therefore find themselves in heavy forms of depression mm-hmm. that the only way beyond this in some in some senses i think guess is to return to that 14th century mm-hmm. christian mysticism that says the self actually can really matter um right in, in this perspective the self is utterly loved and taken up and finds union with god but it yes. only happens through the self entering into death and confessing yeah um, wow and that's a very different model of pastoral ministry than thinking of yourself as an innovator that's trying to get more out of less you know what I mean? yeah and, and, yeah, um, yeah. So just trying to really raise those issues it's so good i um i i thought you did a great job in the chapter on mysticism emphasizing the fact that this is a you know the phrase transcend and include like you're letting go, but the self is included in this move. You know, that's the yeah. union piece. Like it's it's not lost. And I think there might be certain certain forms of mysticism from other other religious traditions that more are that do more emphasize an utter loss of the self, um, yeah. complete, you know, um absorption with the with the divine or something. But this I, and it's funny, the timing of this is funny. Have you ever read um I literally just finished it today? Uh, have you read um Francis Spufford's um Unapologetic? Are you familiar with this book? No. Um no. He is, I have it right behind me. I'll scoot back and grab it real quick. Um, he is a novelist, um, mm. actually a, a brilliant novelist, becoming one of my favorite writers in general. And I didn't realize he was a Christian, but he has this emotional defense of Christianity. He's a British guy wow. who was an atheist for a few years. But anyways, the only reason I bring it up is because the second, I think it's the second chapter is yeah. a chapter on God. And it's basically his narration of a mystical experience Wow! in which he, and because he's a beautiful writer, he does this so well, he articulates the experience of the encounter with the divine, but not the loss of the self. It's yeah. a powerful, so it was just a, funny to me that I read this right after reading your, your book and preparing for this interview, because that, it narrated perfectly, I think, what you're getting at and what those ancient mystics did as well. Um, yeah. That seems to me, as I think about our cultural moment and everything you're saying, um, and the logics of how the even how the institution of the church is pressured to survive within it, um, and how the in many ways the pastor and your book, the pastor in a secular age, talks about the different ages that you know pastors adopt certain things. I see and feel in me a temptation to be that manager of the yeah. creative, innovative self to yeah. try to perpetuate the survival of the institution of the church in a neoliberal context. Like every, it, I just, yeah. I see it and I feel it. And so I love the idea of this mystical path, confession, encounter with negation and death. Um, and honestly, I, and I don't mean to, I even feel as I say this, I almost in our, I can, I can spin this into an innovative act in itself. It's like, well, we can leverage mysticism, you know, to really <laughs> impact, impact the world and make, you know, make real change but so with that caveat i do see at people my age i'm 36 i see people in my very very secular city in northern new england who i think need this message actually like need the message of the loss of the self like it's okay to let the self be crucified and hidden with christ right um to put to death this insatiable need to innovate and be creative and the anxiety that comes with that to put that to death is good news for people i think and so i see i do see a really powerful um 
I do see a powerful way forward, actually, that you're pointing us to. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, and this is, you know, obviously a, a kind of Christian theological assertion, but this move towards the creative self is a real way of saving the self, you know, yeah. like, and it's, yeah. it's just really mm-hmm. fascinating that work actually says, uh, well, if you can work hard, and if you can find the right job, and <laughs> you can find your creativity out of it, and you can wield it into a network that can keep you, you know, on projects, you know, mm-hmm. you, you can save yourself. You can, you can become an interesting self. And I do think that there is really good news in saying to let go of the self Mm -hmm. Um, again, not because the self becomes obliterated in, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, kind of infinite um, elimination of all things. It's not like, you know, I heard Huckabees or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know that with uh, Mark Wahlberg, there is, (laughs) there is no, there is no anything. There's just, you know, that we just Mm. disappear. It isn't that uh, the self becomes utterly um, important, but it uh, becomes through its death experience, it becomes put back into relationship with God yeah. who's a minister, you know? So, so in, in many ways, I want us to get back to the self is the one who receives and gives ministry. Um, mm. or the self is the one who um, gives and receives creativity and wields that towards wins. You know That's what I mean? So like, yeah. There's no, there's no winning in the, in the Christian gospel, really. The only, <laughs> the only winning is through losing. And, you know, I mean, Paul keeps saying that over and over again. And, and obviously Jesus own words about uh, the first will be last and the last will be first. There's there, you know, there, there's, there's no winning. Um, yeah. And, uh, but there yeah. is communion and belonging again, back uh, with, with God. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that's so good. Well, we're nearing the end of our, of our time here. So I will, I do, I do want to wrap up. That's a good, that's a really good note to end on. I think, um, is there anything you mentioned a sixth book? I don't know if you can say anything about what you're working on, but if on yeah. the record at least, <laughs> but what? Yeah, no, what are you working on? What can what can people find? Yeah, I'm I'm looking down because I'm trying to remember the title of this. Thing. <laughs> it, it, it just got titled, and uh, it really is building off of this. Um, oh, great! I mean, in some ways, that six series, the, the, this the series of of six books that will be out. I always feel weird when they're like, it's a six volume series. Like, well. I mean, Were you planning on episodic. it being that long, or I, it was it was going to be three? Okay, I and there was really no rhyme or reason why like faith formation yeah. came first, and then the pastor, and then the congregation. Um, you know, so it isn't a systematic theology in any in right. any stretch of the imagination. You know, it's a it's a book that kind of is a kind of cultural philosophy meets constructive theology that 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 uh, kind of come together. But then these second three, um, yeah, I mean, they're just kind of building off the the Mm -hmm. themes and the realities of of the of the first three in many ways and this one picks up kind of where this innovation book uh the sixth one picks up where this innovation book leads off which is to go deeper into what do we mean by the self and then to think about how the self actually is transformed Um, oh man and so i'm i'm making i around my house it's called my memoir book Mm. because um i i try to make a claim that the memoirist that there's a strange thing that's happened that uh, mysticism has returned culturally. Uh, yeah. That there's a kind of mystical dynamic, I think, to our larger culture. But what's fascinating is most of the mysticism that re- has returned is a mysticism without God. Like you can yeah. now have these mystical realities without God. And for the most part, the memoirist becomes the mystic without God. Um, mm. It really hmm. has this reflective process and writes about it. Uh, this kind of path of transformation. And uh, so I read all these memoirs and there often is in these, in these memoirs, these people who have no interest in God, but they'll have some kind of mystical experience, whether it's love or it's finding what they want to do in life or they're, they walk, you know, 200 miles and it changes their lives. So I try to trace out the self in this kind of spirituality and then um, get deeper into these um into these mystics of negation and how we think about that. So the book is uh, going to be called the church, uh, the church in an age of secular mysticisms. Oh, why spiritualities without God fail to transform us. So, oh my gosh. That sounds, yeah, that's the that first time I've ever even told anyone that title. So there you go. Oh, so we got a scoop um, here on, uh, you got a scoop books and big ideas. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, so, congrats on getting that. Yeah. Getting that title landed and, you know, figuring out the next volume. Um, is, is there any sort of timeline you can, can It'll come in on, on or is it sometime yeah, yeah. sure yeah well Sometimes. you've been really prolific with this series and i would i just want to echo you just said they don't need to be read in order if anyone's watching this and is interested in the series you really could pick up the book we've been talking about it could be your first read of the series they I definitely think. are not like the harry potter books you do not definitely not 
and they don't form a chiasm at the end either, you know, no, so like, they <laughs> we could go into all that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. For your time. This has been a really excellent, excellent conversation. Yeah. I found it's it really great to talk to you, Joel. So. so there was my conversation with Andy. Some of my big takeaways from that were the implications of the, uh, the innovative uh, neoliberal economy on ideas of creativity and especially the anxieties that that produces and especially the anxieties that that is connected with in kind of a winner-take-all, high-competition, quasi-Darwinian cultural kind of economic state that we live in and what that might mean for the church. How does the church survive without giving in to those logics? Um, and how can it be a word, of, how can the word uh, word of life, you know, that I believe the gospel is, how, how can the church be a place in which the, those words of life are kind of given to people that are in this place, in, in this economic structure and in this cultural moment that Andy and I talked about. Um, so been thinking about all that stuff ever since we talked. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. If there are other uh, writers and thinkers that you would like to see me have similar conversations with, please let me know. Uh, I am really interested in exploring what we can do, you know, with these kind of conversation spaces, especially on this channel. It's a really exciting prospect for me. So please uh, send me recommendations, send me thoughts, send me feedback on how this conversation went, other ideas, other books you'd like me to explore, anything along those lines. But as always, I hope you found something worth thinking about, something worth reflecting on, something that provoked your own intellect as you uh, checked out the stuff that I'm putting on this channel. Um, so thank you as always for watching.